Good morning and a warm welcome to all our veterans and whānau to Kororo with Veterans 2021. I am Brett Tefioro, a veteran like you, and it is my privilege to help you find your way around this online event and guide you throughout this kōrero. We are excited of being here today and catching up with you. Without further ado, may I now introduce you to Bernadine McKenzie, the Head of Veteran Affairs. Bernadine. Tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome to our first ever online kōrero with veterans. I'm really excited to know that we have veterans and whānau joining us from around New Zealand and from overseas. So firstly, to our veterans, thank you for your service to our country, Aotearoa New Zealand. To our veterans, spouses, partners and whānau, thank you for the support you provide to our veterans. To everyone, thank you all for tuning in today. Today's online forum really is a first for us and a bit nerve wracking, I must say. And I would like to thank those organisations who are also here supporting this new initiative. They will shortly be sharing information about the services and supports that are available for you and your families. We've loved see seeing our veterans and their families face to face when we've been out and about. But unfortunately, the current environment, we've, we've needed to find another way to really stay connected with you and you with us. This doesn't mean our face-to-face -face forums are coming to an end. Far from it. It really means that we're looking for a safe way to do this. And we'll be back when we, um, with our programme next year when it is um, safe to do so. It has been a long, hard year for many. And the global pandemic means that many of us have been separated from friends and loved ones. It's been particularly tough for those in, us in Auckland. And I want to acknowledge those Aucklanders who are here today with us. We've had to learn new ways of communicating and staying connected with each other. I know that today brings us all that little bit closer by using a virtual platform that has now become commonplace for many of us. I hope that you enjoy the next couple of hours. We will be asking you for your feedback in coming days, so don't forget to take some notes down and tell us what you think. It's now my pleasure to invite Vic, Victor Timu from the Veteran, Vietnam Veterans Association to deliver our opening karakia. Kia ora, Vic. A kia ora, kai whakahaere, a te ikaka, a whero, a tenei te mihi i atu ki a Ano Ake, 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 amane. Kea, kue, Brett, over to you. Thank you, Bernadine. Thank you, Vic. If you have just joined us, this kōrero is live on Zoom and Facebook. For those on Zoom, you will have access to the breakout rooms where you can have Q&A with the presenter after their presentation. You can find links to these breakout rooms in the Zoom chat function you see on your page. If you're watching on Facebook, you can ask questions in the comments, but it'll take a little bit longer to get back to you. If you have registered online for an appointment with one of our case managers, please go to the Veteran Affairs Information Breakout Room. You'll then be moved into your private appointment when that time's uh, right. 
Once you've completed your time in the breakout room, please come back into the main room. We'd love to see you watching our other presentations. This event has been recorded, and you'll have access to the recording on the Virtual Affairs Facebook page in a couple of days. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Sharon Kavanagh, Manager, Veteran Services. Sharon. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. Ko Sharon Kavanagh, tōku i noa. Welcome to this presentation, everyone. Before we start, I hope you can all hear me. And if you wouldn't mind, please making sure that you have the volume adjusted on your devices, either switched off or turned to silent. So I'll start off with the mission that we have at Veterans Affairs, which is to ensure that veterans receive the support, recognition, entitlements and services available to them so that they lead a healthy and productive life. I wanted to give you all some numbers so you get a sense of the mahi, the work that we do at Veterans Affairs. So for the last 12 months, ending June 2021, we have provided services and support to over 13,000 veterans and their whānau. We help maintain 183 service cemeteries. We have paid out $113.2 million in financial entitlements. We have provided veterans independence program services to 6,500 veterans. And we have taken internally, we've received 33,500 phone calls through our inquiry line. I now want to talk to you about some of the changes to the Veterans Support Act, which came into effect from October 2020. So what does that mean for veterans? Well, what it means for you is improved access to services for you, improved support for your whānau, improved end-of-life support for you as the veteran and your whānau, and also we've removed unfair provisions from the legislation. We also spend um, some of our time and the mahi that we do at Veterans Affairs supporting, as you all know, Vietnam veterans. And so we have a number of objectives uh, for the three-year period beginning 2020, which was last year and which will end um, June 2023. And so those objectives are to improve wellbeing and connection for Vietnam vets. We want to help veterans receive the services and support to which they're entitled. And we want to ensure that we're fulfilling the 2006 Memorandum of Understanding for Vietnam veterans. So the key areas of support are uh, we continue to mahi, to work to find as many Vietnam veterans as we can. We continue to raise awareness of available services and support along with our partners. We update how we um, undertake the annual uh, medical assessment and we also provide information on positive ageing. I now want to talk to you about ex gratia payments for Vietnam veterans because most of you will be aware that last week, the 29th of November, the uh, government approved funding to enable two new medical conditions to be added to the list of prescribed conditions eligible for ex gratia payment under that 2006 MOU. So those new conditions are monoclonal gemopathy of undetermined significance, or the shortened name, MGUS, as well as hypertension. Over 700 veterans, Vietnam veterans, are immediately impacted by that change. And currently, Viet, Viet, uh, sorry, my apologies, Veterans Affairs staff, case managers, are making contact with veterans who have been diagnosed with one of these conditions, and predominantly that is hypertension, 
to let the veteran know that they are eligible for an ex gratia payment and can expect to receive that by the end of February 2022. I'm now going to be uh, racing off to answer any questions any of you may have. I hope that's been informative. Nya mihi. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Sharon's just walking off to another computer to join the presenter's breakout room. If you'd like to ask Sharon a question about veteran affairs, please join her in the presenter's breakout room now. If you're having problems with Zoom, we may be able to help you. Call my friend James on 021-927-476. Or you can leave a message for James in the Zoom chat box you see on the bottom of your screen. Click on the link in the Zoom chat box to go to the presenter breakout room or stay here and watch our next presentation. Our next presenter is Marty Donoghue, Chief Executive of the RNZ RSA National Headquarters. Marty, the floor is yours. A tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, nā mihi kia koutou. Ko Marty Donoghue ahau. Nā te moa e takahi te rata. That short whakatauki is about the moa and the trampled rata. Uh, unfortunately, uh, veterans as they transition, we generally end up supporting them too late or at the bottom of the cliff. RSA support is all about trying to intervene where it's most appropriate and ensuring that in fact we're not waiting to the bottom of the cliff. However, I have to acknowledge that as our kumara does not talk how sweet they are, unfortunately for the last few years the RSA has been a bit of a rotten pumpkin. And I, at this time I'd really like to acknowledge all those other veteran NGOs that have stepped up to the plate. Whether it's Crazy Dave and his hunting expeditions, which I'm yet to go on, Rebecca Nelson and Takiwi Meyer, uh, Amy and Pilgrim Bandits, Tina looking after the children of the fallen, Slash and the Onward Bar, and No Duff, Bobby from the Veterans Surfing Association, again, all these veteran NGOs that have stood up and are providing support to our veterans. The definition of a veteran is uh, vexatious and complex to say the least. So the RSA has a far simpler version of that. And that is any person that served in the NZDF, anybody as you go through that waharoa and attest, we will treat you as a veteran. And we also acknowledge that families are a huge part of support to veterans and ensuring that veterans live a healthy and good life. We also acknowledge that there are other veterans in our communities that haven't served with the New Zealand Defence Force, but we will support them as well. The change in demographics is, is quite impactful for the support that we are providing. Uh, there is a phrase that I'll use, the RSA is old, but our veterans are not. And that acknowledges that since 1990, we've created close on 40,000 new veterans. And unfortunately, either in, in the public and particularly with government, this is not all that well recognised. Now, when I, when I talk about with government, um, our interaction with Veterans Affairs, we always work together with them to achieve a better outcome for veterans. Whilst we will have a bit of raru raru with them, it is all within that uh, mindset or vision that we'll achieve a better outcome for veterans. So we do have a significant veteran population 
out there that needs our support. Uh, what is discouraging is the fact that quite often that gets lost in the noise and a lot of public perception is that at the end of World War II, there were no more conflicts. And certainly a lot of the services that the RSA provided now need to reflect the change and particularly the growth in population since 1990. The other thing that we have to contend with is since those operations in 1990 to 2000, a lot of our veterans now have done multiple operations. Um, they're more complex and there are more complex uh, issues impacting our veterans and certainly our services need to start reflecting that. Only this morning the Mental Health and Wellbeing Commission released its report uh, and in the opening statement of that report it finally acknowledges veterans and I'm just going to re read to you the most marginalised groups, including veterans, felt life as less, less worthwhile and reported less security, poorer mental health, poor overall health, greater discrimination and more barriers to wellbeing. So we do have challenges ahead of us. On the positive, uh, I am very grateful to the many RSA volunteers, our district support managers, our district support advisors, our support advisors, and those within the RSA community that give their all to support veterans and their families. We have a lot of change to go under and a lot of things to confront because whilst the RSA is old, our veterans are not. But those are challenges that I think we're up to. Na mihi koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you, Māori. If you'd like to chat to Māori about the RSA, please go now to the presenter breakout room. And he'll see you there shortly. We also have a Veteran Affairs Information Breakout Room. If you would like to know more about Veteran Affairs support and entitlements, things like Veterans Pension, other entitlements you may be able to get, please go there and you'll see two of our Veteran Affairs staff, Gerard and Alex. Our next presenter is Mark Williamson, Benefits Manager, New Zealand Defence Force, Force Financial Hub. He will be presenting on the NZDF Force Financial Hub, which is available for all service men and women, whether you're serving or you are not. Mark, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, to you today. It's, it's a great pleasure to be able to do this. Just on a personal note, I've been with the Defence Force for 16 years as a civilian member of Defence. My father is a 98-year-old World War II veteran, still living in the own, his own home in, in, in the North Shore in Auckland. Uh, fiercely independent, very proud, but, but uh, both he and the family are very grateful for the services that are provided by uh, Veterans Affairs. I'd like to talk to you today about the services that are also provided to veterans and their families through the Force Financial Hub. What, what is the Force Financial Hub? Well, it's an internet-based portal to, to access it, you, have, you, you need access, access to the internet. Google Force Financial Hub and you'll find it's a one-stop shop. There's a range of benefits, services and tools there for members of Defence Force and their families and veterans and their families. And a key thing about the Force Financial Hub is that when a member ceases service with the Defence Force, they continue to access these benefits and services and similarly their families do as well. And you'll see that we're now deliberately reaching out to the veteran community, again, as recognition of a thank you for the contribution that they've made to the country and to the Crown over, over many years of service. The Force Financial Hub is also linked to the Force for Families programs that are also available to uh, veterans and their families. 
Well, what's the purpose of the Force Financial Hub? Well, we recognise that financial wellbeing is an important wellbeing indicator. We aim to enhance the financial wellbeing and security of members and their families, and veterans and their families, and we aim to provide members with the tools to make the best financial decisions for themselves. And through this, we support our operational preparedness and the New Zealand Defence Force strategic goals, particularly our People 25 strategy, which has just been updated. And through this, we also aim to reach out more effectively to the veterans community. How do we operate? Well, we use our bulk purchasing power to get favourable deals for the defence community, which are either provided free or where there's a charge, they're provided at a, a good discounted price. We obtain arrangements that members themselves wouldn't be able to get as individuals. So as an example, service people serving in Iraq or Af Afghanistan over the last 10 to 15 years may have had their own private insurance arrangements, but you'll find that those insurance arrangements would definitely exclude uh, operations in those countries. And so we, we have in place an insurance program that covers every situation where our people may be directed to go by government. We also have comprehensive house and contents insurance, uh, particularly for those zones where there's maybe earthquake industry, ex uh, industry exclusions in place. And again, what we're endeavouring to do is provide tools for members to help them cope with what is an increasingly challenging environment. Many of our people come to the service now with student loans. We are facing housing affordability issues throughout the country, whether it's to buy or to rent. People are living longer, which is great, it means they're going to be retired longer, which is great, but for many of our younger people, they're going to face the situation where they'll need to have more of their own funds to give them the comfortable retirement that we all wish to have. So let's look at some of the key components that may be of interest to veterans and the families in particular. We have a comprehensive staff insurance program, the Member Insurance Benefits Program, and we're now deliberately reaching out to veterans for anyone who served in the services after 1990. And the MIBP is also available to family members and, and partners as well. We have a comprehensive funeral plan that's available for anyone age 50 up. And what that does is it enables you to buy coverage to pay for the cost of the funeral should either the veteran or family member pass away at some stage in the future. We have a domestic insurance programme which covers your house, your contents, your vehicle, um, and that's available and may be of interest to veterans as well. And we also have an arrangement with Southern Cross where you're able to purchase medical insurance cover for those of you who may be interested in that. We provide a free will service and a discounted power of attorney. Sadly, within defence, we actually lose about 14 to 15 people per year who pass away. The vast majority of those deaths are non-work related. But what we find is probably about 30 to 40% of the deaths will have a will when they pass away, and the remaining 60% or so don't. And that's why we now have a free will service, and that service is also available to veterans and their partners as well. We have a financial advice and a mortgage broker service that's available to give advice to veterans and their families, operating out of Smiles Farm on the North Shore. But what they do is they uh, are able to travel around the country when COVID rules permit, and um, we, we do encourage people to utilise their service. And there's also a discount page available through the Force for Families as well for people who may be interested in having a look at that. This is just a graphic indication of what the Force for Families site looks like, and you'll see there's a number of sectors there that actually target uh, veterans and their families. So I'd like to talk in a little bit more detail about the, the savings schemes that we provide within Defence, both for serving personnel and former personnel, as well as veterans and their families. We have our own KiwiSaver scheme, the New Zealand Defence Force KiwiSaver scheme. We're the only employer in the country with our own KiwiSaver scheme. And we have a separate scheme called the New Zealand Defence Force FlexiSaver scheme. As of the middle of November, we've got a combined membership, 7,722 and funds under management of around about 256. It's around, I think it's up to about 260 million now. With the KiwiSaver scheme, the focus is on saving for retirement and buying a first home for the younger members. And for the FlexiSaver scheme, the focus is on saving for your financial goals. And we find that the FlexiSaver scheme may be of particular interest to the veteran community, because at the moment, for many of us, we have money in the bank, and we may be receiving interest rate payments of perhaps 1%, 1.25%, 1 
when you take into account inflation and take into account the tax that's taken off those earnings, in effect you're in negative territory where you're paying the bank to hold on to your money for you. So the FlexiSaver scheme gives you the opportunity to invest your money, earn potentially higher returns depending on what portfolio you want to invest in, although accepting there's also some risk that may come with that as well. Our schemes are managed funds. They, we have daily unit pricing, which, which means, in other words, the prices may go up, up, and day, uh, up and down each day, depending on what the markets may be doing, and there's a range of investment options. We have a very good story to tell in terms of performance, our benefits and fees, and the more members we have, the more services we're able to uh, provide collectively on behalf of the combined um, membership. I'd just like to go forward, uh, flip forward for a minute just to talk more about the investment options that are available. So you'll see there's seven investment options available, range from cash at the very conservative low risk side of the table to the other end where there's a shares portfolio and in between we have conservative, moderate, balanced, growth and high growth portfolios, each with an element of risk depending on what you're prepared to accept. Just to have a look at the returns over the last year, and this is after deduction of fees and taxes. So you'll see that for the cash portfolio, as to be expected, the returns have basically been zero. And then for the conservative, 3.1%, for the moderate, 7.1%, for the balanced portfolio, 11.4%, for the growth portfolio, 15.7%, the high growth, 19.2%, the shares portfolio, 20.6%. And these are after deduction of fees and taxes. Now, there's no guarantee that past returns will be uh, guaranteed for the future. But if you have a look at the five-year return, that gives you a better indi indication of what the norm has been over the last five years. And again, as you can see, for those of you who may have some money in the bank, uh, most of those investment portfolios would have been delivering higher returns than you would have received uh, for your money in the bank. Anyone interested in finding out more about this can go to the uh, Force Financial Hub. Again, just a reminder, you Google Force Financial Hub and have a look at the um, page for the uh, Kiwi Saver Scheme and the Flexi Saver Scheme. Or you can all, uh, write to me care of the email address, and please, if you've got a pen, write this down, benefits at nzdf.mil.nz. That's benefits at nzdf.mil.nz. If you write to me care of that address, we will actually send you out a member pack to your home address. So please feel free to do that if you'd like to receive some more information. You'll see that with our schemes, we have a number of apps that are available for the members to help them plot what's actually going on with their money. So we're right up there with the uh, technology and the modern technology, and we've also produced a monthly report which shows you the returns uh, on the Force Financial Hub as, as well. I'd just like to go back again and talk a bit more about the, um, the returns. I'll just show you in graphic form um, what this actually means. Here we are. No, sorry, one more one. OK. So this is a chart that shows the returns for our schemes for the last six years. And we've just plotted those returns graphically because sometimes people like to see them in graph form rather than in table form. So if you look at the blue line, that's the cash portfolio, you can see you actually haven't lost any money over the last six years, but nor have you gained very much, particularly when you take into account recent inflation and tax and everything else. The next line up is the conservative portfolio, that's the green line, and then the line above that is the moderate. At the other end of the scale, you can see the, the blue line at the top is the, the shares portfolio, and the one below it, the pink line, is the high growth. What that indicates again is that over the last six years the returns have been considerably higher, but there's also been a great deal more volatility, which reflects what has been going on in the markets, particularly the period we went through March and April of last year when the COVID impact first um, hit. What this highlights again is that regardless of where you have your money, um, you may be able to get greater returns, but of course coming with that is, is greater risk as well. And so that's why we provide a financial advice service to help people with their decision making. And again, if you Google the Force Financial Hub, you'll find the contact details for the financial advice service. That's Milestone Direct Limited. Uh, their details are on the, on the, the uh, Force Financial Hub. It's actually headed up by an ex-Army major. Uh, and so he he's, has a very good in, uh, indication, a good idea of what it's like to be in the services and the challenges that uh, defence families face. 
And so again, a very good resource there for us all to use if we wish to do so. So I'd just like to round off again and say um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the forum. I also hope we'll get a chance to meet in person at some stage in the near future. I understand from Bernadine and Elaine that we will be hitting the road again in early 2022, which is very exciting. But in the meantime, I please do encourage you all to go to the Force Financial Hub uh, to have a look at what's available. Um, and uh, you'll see also our benefits email address for you to write if you'd like some uh, written information to be uh, sent out to you. I'm now going to be uh, um, going sitting in the presenter's breakout room, so happy to answer any questions that people may have. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Mark. If you'd like to ask Mark a question about the New Zealand Defence Force, Force Financial Hub, and all the benefits he just talked about, Mark will be in the presenter's breakout room very, very shortly. Next up, I welcome uh, Andy Peters, President of the New Zealand Vietnam Veterans Association. Andy, the floor is yours. Hi, kia ora no tātou katoa. My name's Andrew Peters of Ngāpuhi and Ngāti Kahu descent. I joined the Army in 1968 I served in Vietnam with Victor Four Company, May 1969 to May 1970. Currently, I'm in my third term as the president of the Vietnam Veterans Association. Firstly, let's look at the background to the Vietnam Veterans Association. 1964 to 1974, we had the Vietnam conflict. Right. Over 3,800 New Zealanders served in that conflict, including engineers, 161 battery, 1 RNZR, the medical corps, SAS, and towards the end, or the last teams in there were the um, Training teams, 1974. 37 soldiers died on active service. When they came home, as you can see there, wasn't very inviting. Not for 21 year olds, 20, 21 year olds, after doing one year service, majority doing one year service in Vietnam. The last rifle company, Victor VI was withdrawn from Vietnam on the 6th of December 1971, 50 years ago. The association was first formed in 1985. It was then called the Ex-Vietnam Services Association. In 2014, there was a name change to the New Zealand Vietnam Veterans Association Incorporated. Main objective was to care for veterans and their families, looking at medical issues and well-being. Also to advocate for veterans and their families. And it goes on as per the slide. One of the big issues, sustainability. We're all getting, we're all in our 70s at the moment, at least. So, uh, yes. Two thousand and six, a very big year for the Vietnam Veterans Association. Up to then, the veterans, Vietnam veterans, paid for their own welcome home. Well, uh, welcome home 98, that was held in Wellington. After that, during 2006, the Crown and representatives of the Vietnam veterans signed a memorandum of understanding 
memorandum of understanding was acknowledgement, part acknowledgement by the Crown at the time <coughs> of the veteran service in Vietnam. Right. It also acknowledged the use of dioxin, which was sprayed in Vietnam. So now we have the Memorandum of Understanding, which acknowledges that. And the Memorandum of Understanding also um, lays out an ex gratia payment of 40000 <clears throat> or to the veteran or 25000 to the surviving spouse or partner of a veteran with qualifying operational service in Vietnam. The conditions, specified conditions, are based on the United, Nation, United States National Academy of Sciences research into the use of dioxin. And we have five of them listed here, the first five. I, up until recently, they were the only ones, soft tissue sarcoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease, chlorine, and chronic lymphomatic leukemia. It's all on there anyway. The two bottom ones, monoclonal gamma pathy, or MGSU, and hypertension, <clears throat> which just was acknowledged just last week. Right. So <clears throat> my advice to those who have those conditions, go through your, go through first case, Vietnam, uh, sorry, the Veterans Affairs, telling that you can go through your local support advisor or what we used to call welfare officer, right? For those who are having, or well, with the memorandum of understanding, the government gave a grant of seven million to the association for 30 years. The interest of which is used to assist uh, veterans and their families through the Veterans and Families Trust for things like um, uh, putting in uh, heat pumps, improving your living conditions, right, around the home. Also available to Vietnam veterans and their families is the Children and Grandchildren's Trust. And you can, those who uh, prove hardship can apply to that trust for things like education for the children, um, sporting events, uh, and so forth. Right. Right at this moment, some of the major issues, we, the Executive Committee of the Vietnam Veterans Association, believe is the priority. Our first priority is health and well-being of the veteran. Remembering, we are all in our 70s. Secondly, the welfare of our families, wives, widows, children. We must look after them. The sustainability of our association going forward. Up to now, everything has been done on a voluntary basis. Times have changed, technology is in, and we have some very talented children. For example, on our current committee, we have a microbiologist, the son of a veteran. He's 
a professor, lecturer at Auckland University Nursing School. We have a psychologist, just recently qualified, master's degree in psychology, a daughter of another veteran, daughter of another veteran. She's a lawyer and the son of another veteran. He's an IT specialist, teaches computers. At the moment, we've got them involved in the current committee. We have to encourage there are more, I'm sure, out there. Very qualified young people, which we can employ, use in our association. Remembering that the association must, I believe, continue for their benefit. Gone are the days of volunteers. A lot of our young people have jobs, have families to raise. We're going to look at the status of our association. Currently, it's um, incorporated society. Look at charitable trust. Subscriptions, $20 a year. And expect three uh, magazines printed and posted out. Have another thing. The big one is at the AGM at our next reunion, 16th of February, 2022 in Christchurch. Hopefully we'll, we'll have a draft rule change for everyone to see and vote on. Looking forward, coming events, sites of interest, right, as there on slide, National Vietnam Veterans Association Reunion in Christchurch, 15th to the 17th of February next year, 2022. Something to look forward to. We're booked in or we're using the new Christchurch Convention Centre. It hasn't even been opened yet, but uh, we're booked in there. So it's something to look forward to. A number of uh, subunits, they've, had, they've postponed their reunions, a couple on there, it's later on in the next year. Of interest, the NZVVA website, right. to get in on that, ring the uh, association secretary or get hold of the association secretary and uh, she'll provide you with a password to get in. A lot of our information goes out on Facebook. Right. And we've got three sites here. Use them or read them. Please respect others' opinions. That's why we went to war. Freedom of speech. Respect everyone's opinions. Um, they may not agree with you. Some certainly don't agree. I don't agree with them, but I, that's why we went to war. Read them. Look at them. They're interesting reading. From an early age, I learned uh, a, a, a word, te ao huri huri, the changing world. And this is very much a changing world, very different to when you and I uh, were born. Very, very different. Learn to adapt, because it's almost as if it's going to be the norm with these um, viruses and medical issues coming in. But remember, above everything, the family comes first. Look after the family. Look after yourself. Yeah. You 
be more use to anyone else if you stay healthy. Nā reira, kia koutou katoa, huri noa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Pātai mai ki au, hea te mea nui o tēnau, mā kue ki, e tāta, e tāta, e tāta. What is the most important thing in this world? It's people. People like you and me. Kia ora, noa, noa ora mai. Thank you, Andy. A lot of great information for our Vietnam veteran community. Thank you for that. Our next presenter is David Benfell, presenting on Soldiers, Sailors and Airmen Association of New Zealand, or SANES, as I like to be called. David, the floor is yours. Kia ora team, my name is David Benfell and I am the National Coordinator of the Soldiers, Sailors and Airmen Association of New Zealand and I'm here to introduce the Charitable Trust to you uh, today. So what is SANES? Uh, basically um, we have myself as a trustee, uh, Michael Hooky Walker uh, and Chris Morris are the three trustees, uh, John Harris is Ops Manager. Uh, ben Peckham is a manager, uh, and we have Candice and Joe working on our social media and our admin. So that's the team of SANES. We are all closely connected to the veteran and the services community. Uh, and what SANES does is we organise and we subsidise outdoor activities for veterans and their whānau. And when I say veterans, I mean the widest sense of the word. If you served, we consider you a veteran. Doesn't matter if you deployed. On, on, on any deployments overseas, okay? So, outdoor activities, why do we do it? Every single one of the core uh, management of SANES has used the outdoors as their therapist, their doctor and their medication. Uh, we as service people know there's all sorts of struggles we face when we get out of the military and we've all had our ups and downs and, and all the management ha have had all the same issues we, we all experience. But the outdoors is the difference. That's what pulled us through. That's what got our fitness, kept us fit, kept us in a positive frame of mind, helped us when we were really down. And connecting with other service people as well once we'd left was really, really important. And we realized this. So at its heart, SANES is our way to share that with the services community. Army, Navy, and Air Force currently serving and ex-serving. It's our way to say, modern life is busy. You need those lighthouse moments. You need events that you can look forward to. You need challenges in your life and you need adventure and you need to stay connected with the services community because we have that bond and uh, it's very important to maintain that bond. A lot of our events do revolve around uh, diving for kai, hunting for food to feed our families, um, fly fishing, um, fishing, that kind of thing. Now there's a reason for that. As I, as I mentioned before, the core group of SANES, myself, Chris and Michael and John, we've all used the outdoors in a certain way and hunting and fishing has been actually very central to that. Um, so we use our experience to teach the people on the courses and to instruct on the courses so we can make them as cheap as possible and we have connections throughout that industry. I, I work in that industry. So what sort of events do we run? Uh, we have two main standout events that are our most popular. Uh, well, three really. So we have the Round the Mountain, which is a traverse of the Northern Circuit and around Mount Ruapehu, which is about 75 k's. Um, we have the Southern Traverse, which is basically the East Coast to the West Coast of the Southern Alps. And we have our hunting skills courses that we run. Uh, those three are our most popular events. Uh, obviously the traverses on the Round the Mountain, quite a long way to walk, a great achievement, great way to kick off your fitness, and uh, we get great feedback from those events. Um, the hunting skills course, very popular. As soon as we launch an event, um, it's full within probably half a day to a day, and it just seems to be getting more and more popular. We run up to four hunting skills courses up and down New Zealand uh, each, each year. As we grow, we'll only look to run more events. 
So some of our events might have a small cost if you're, if you're a financial member, but uh, that's only, there's no other way we can do the events we do without recouping a small amount of money off some of the participants. Now a hunting skills course is three days, uh, starting on the Friday lunchtime. Uh, we'll take you through uh, marksmanship, uh, how to ethically kill your animal, dressing your animal out, stalking techniques, safety equipment, um, and, and everything you need to know to get you started on your hunting journey. We'll provide the food and we will get you around the stations that we use for the hunting skills course. Now that would cost a single person $30 or thereabouts for that course. So three, a three day hunting course for $30 uh, we try to keep the costs as low as we possibly can for our participants. Uh, you'll find all, of vol all the volunteers volunteer their time, uh, all of the people that I mentioned, none of them claim travel, no one is paid anything to do these events and you'll find most of us pay for our own travel, okay? So the money that gets paid into the charity literally goes straight back into the events that we run. The other kinds of events that we do, we do uh, kayaking, diving, We've done fishing charters. Uh, one popular one that we're looking at running soon is foraging courses. We go out uh, into the Nahida, into the bush, uh, and learn what you can forage uh, and, and, and gather uh, to either heal yourself or perhaps for, for food. Uh, last year, we ran a three-day kayaking trip on Lake Tarawera, which was very successful, and we'll look to run another one this year. We have been affected by COVID, obviously, over the last couple of years. Uh, and we have cancelled quite a few events. We're only limited by the size of the charity at the moment, meaning as we grow, we will do more events around the country as the budget, as we get more budget and, and more funds become available to us. With our events team, we're open to suggestions as well. We only have a small budget, we are a small charitable trust, but if you have an idea for an event that we could run, or a location, or you have a spare boat you might want to use, which you can uh, bring on an event to offer out to the, to the people on the event, uh, to, to fish or dive or something along those lines, please just get in touch. As long as it gets us together as a community, uh, is fun, it has an element of fitness, and it has an element of learning and social activity, then we'll absolutely consider running those kinds of events. We also have some subsidies that we run so uh, if you want to learn how to dive, four or five people over the course of the year will pay $250 to $300 depending on our budget towards your paddy open water dive course. Okay, you book it, we pay the, uh, pay the course provider and you get that discounted off your, off your course. Most courses will cost between five and $600 so you can see that's a fantastic, uh, a fantastic discount. Uh, we also are looking at providing subsidies for helicopter rides for hunters uh, to go out into the Alps or into the North Island, into the massive beautiful ranges that we have out there to, uh, to hunt and fish. Uh, and those are looking like, depending on budget, three to four hundred dollars per, per trip. So we do have, um, we do have subsidies that we pay out uh, for members to go and have their own adventures, uh, but they are when we have the budget and we'll launch those through, through our website. It's all good me saying this to you, but here's a short clip of someone who's just done an event with us and you can get to see um, what it is people get off these events and why it's important for veterans to do this. So we have Travis Gillage here, joining us from the Australian Navy. So introduce yourself please Travis. Yeah, as you said, my name's Travis, I was in the Navy for 98 to 2002. I uh, did service uh, East Timor or the Persian Gulf and Christmas Island for water protection roles. I uh, got out of the Navy in 2002 and uh, 20 years later I'm sitting, moved across New Zealand and sitting here on this crazy adventure that is around the mountain. How did you find it when you got out? Uh, initially it was okay, it wasn't until about 10 to 15 years later that uh, all the mental bits and pieces started coming out and it wasn't until I reached out to a fellow Navy mate I had in uh, Perth uh, where he advised that I was entitled to some help which I never knew anything about when I left the forces. So um, some can say it's 10 years too late, but um, it's good to get that help when I needed it the most and having the people around me that was able to help through. Awesome, mate. Thanks for sharing that. Um, how did you get put on to SANES and uh, 
How have you found the event? What do you think other veterans could get out of this sort of thing? Yeah, sure. Uh, lucky enough, I just happened to be watching the project one night. Um, there was an interview, I can't remember the guy's name, uh, but he promoted sayings on the project. And we ended up finding the Facebook page, and my wife said, this would be absolutely perfect for you, get in touch with some other vets. Uh, people understand you better than I do, and to go out and have some fun. Um, she said that uh, around the mountain would be a perfect thing for me. Uh, along with all my exercise and everything else, but no matter how much training I've done, it didn't prepare me for, <laughs> for this trip, and it's been absolutely amazing. Um, I've gained five new brothers out of this trip. Um, done stuff I'd never thought I'd ever do. Faced a hell of a lot of fears, and it's just been phenomenal. You've done amazing, mate. You've done amazing. You see, uh, we all have up, we all have up and down days. Yeah. Each one of us say, "I have a slow day, I have a slow day," but we yeah. just we crack on, we joke, we get through it as a team. Yeah. And we're uh, on our last few hours, mate. Last few hours. <laughs> last few hours. And looking forward to that camaraderie at the end to exactly. finish it all off with. <laughs> exactly, mate. A few beers. <laughs> good on you, Travis. I appreciate you uh, supporting the chariot, coming on the event, and uh, it's been good to meet you. Before the next one, day. Awesome, mate. Cheers. So who is eligible to go on our events? As I said, veterans and their immediate family. Now, if you've left the military, you can still apply to come on one of our events through the Rest Stand Clear program, who you'll often hear us refer to the RSC program. That is our pool of funding that we have to fully pay for a person's event. So their event is cost free, and that's when they're struggling with any one of life's difficulties, perhaps financial difficulties, perhaps mental health, maybe illness. Uh, anything along those lines you can apply or you can apply on behalf of someone else and we will pay uh, for their event as long as we have the, the funding in place. If you are serving in the New Zealand Defence Force at the moment, if you are currently serving you are already eligible and you're already a member of SANES, you can apply to come on our events. You just need to sign up on our website which is www.sssa nz.co.nz. Go on there, subscribe to our newsletter, which means when we launch an event, it'll be on the website. We'll launch it through our email list, which you would have signed up to, and it'll be on social media as well. And you can find us mostly on Facebook. So, as I said, we have financial members and supporters as well. And for family membership to SANES, it costs $60 per year. But as I said, if you're struggling with any of life's problems, we will pay for your event. And we've done that on almost every single event that we've run. I'd like to mention our partners at the moment. So a lot of our events are funded by either the Ranfurly Veterans Trust or the RSA, uh, National RSA, or our financial members as well. We also have a number of companies that donate to us. The main ones being Aaron Horrell and Grunts Grog. Uh, Australian Defence Apparel, or their retail arm is, is called uh, Alley Gear uh, and they have a retail shop uh, up in Auckland. Okay, in summary guys, we would love to have you on board, we'd love to have your support. Uh, we need financial members, we need people to pass the word around, we need people to get in touch with us. If you know of a veteran or their immediate family member that's struggling with something, that one of these events would help. And just to go over it again, why do they help? Life is very busy. Uh, modern life is very busy. As, as veterans and service people, and when I say veterans, I mean the widest sense of the word. Anybody who has served, I just want to make that clear. Anyone who's served, in my eyes, is considered a veteran and you're eligible uh, to be a part of SANES. So if you have served, there's all sorts of difficulties that we all face reintegrating into civilian life making new friends, finding new employment, all these challenges that we all face. No matter what's going on in your life, we at SANES know that you need the outdoors in your life. You need something in the outdoors that you and your whanau can go out and, and uh, have adventures, stay fit, make plans. Um, and that, that's where we come into it. We'd like to get you started on that journey or we'll reintroduce you back into it. You need to stay in touch with other veterans and service people and their families because we have a, a commonality that when we get together with events, uh, Hockey Walker, Michael Walker, one of the trustees calls it the magic. There's a magic that happens. 
so that bond is always very strong amongst service people in their whānau. So getting together, it's like medicine. And then getting together and doing some crazy adventure like walking across the Alps and then having a beer afterwards, I mean, it, it is absolute magic. Any kind of fitness, guys, we all need to be fitter. Every single one of us, doesn't matter what stage you're at, we all could be fitter, we all could be doing more. Life is so busy, it distracts us from those kinds of things. Well, the outdoors provides us with all that, but in a fun setting and a beautiful setting. New Zealand has the most amazing outdoors in the world. Absolutely world-class, and I've traveled around the world. So for all those reasons and more, that's why we'd like you to be part of the charity. That's why we'd like you to come on our events. That's why we'd like you to spread the word. Uh, there will now be uh, some frequently asked questions, uh, which we'll post up after this. And then I'll be on hand live to answer questions after the presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, David. Wow, what a presentation. If you'd like to know more about, about sayings, you can catch up with David in the presenter breakout room. He'll be in there to ask all your questions about adventure, what you did if you've left back in those days. Our next presenter is Stephanie Clare, Chief Executive of Age Concern New Zealand. Stephanie, the floor is yours. Tēnā koutou katoa. What a pleasure to be here today and talk about things that are close to my heart, which is loneliness. I want to solve this problem, our services, and how we can feel well in the community. So today I'm going to cover a few things, and I'm sure that it might connect with you. You might want to ask a question, so please do whenever you can. So we're going to talk about the mental health impact. We're going to go back about two years. Two years ago we were told COVID was coming and that lockdown, that social disconnection with community had huge impact for our seniors. I work for an organisation called Age Concern New Zealand. Our services are across New Zealand here to help. But with that lockdown came this disconnection of, com of communities, of individuals, of families. And actually we saw the media talking quite differently about seniors. Seniors became visible, seniors became noticed. And in doing that, seniors were in the spotlight, but for all the wrong reasons. We saw about seniors being vulnerable, older, unable to look after themselves. We know for a fact that experience creates resilience. And this enabled us to be able to look after ourselves and look after each other. So we saw a lot of media calls around compromised immune systems, older people being isolated, older people not being able to cope, um, were given that vulnerable label. And as a result, we saw a little few people disrupting that system. So what, what happened two years ago? We went into this thing called Alert Level 4, and we know that it arrived in our country. We talked about community transmission, we can talk about that community transmission today, the same stories there. We also know that there was a fear of widespread clusters and activities. There was a range of measures put out by the government, by communities. We all responded locally and nationally. People were instructed to stay in their bubbles. Go home, stay home. I felt that actually there was a lot of disconnection here. We needed to look after each other. And in doing that, we had to think differently. So we had to think differently about our local activities, our social connections. How, our, how did our gatherings work? How are we going to celebrate our 100-year-old grandma's birthday if we couldn't be together? We actually needed to tell people what to do to look after themselves and support each other. I know this is something that happens all over the world, and certainly with our veterans, we know that you look after each other, and we do too. So we wanted to supply support. We want to provide opportunities. We want to inform you. So what did that mean? That disconnection disrupted us. It actually had an impact on how we felt. Maybe that small disconnection meant that we couldn't connect with our children, our, our grandchildren. How did, how did that go? 
Some of us were depressed, and rightly so. We didn't know what the future held. And today we're in the same sort of space. How long will this go on for? What does a protection framework? What's my role? Where can I connect? And we know that you can call any one of us to, to ask those questions. So mental wellbeing, being connected, has huge impact. We know that loneliness is like smoking a packet of cigarettes a day. And we've been told for a long time that it's bad for your health. So we know loneliness is too. Social connection is the solution. And how can we can do that? Is we can do stuff together. Also, physical well-being. We know the inability to get out and enjoy the great outdoors, the inability to connect, the inability to stay active in your mind. You know, having that conversation about politics with your friend over a coffee or over a beer. We know that that physical well-being has a huge impact on how you feel. We also know that. The reduction of activity means that our physical exercise, our physicalities are compromised. You might have muscle wasting. Actually, something you did last year you might not be able to do today. How can you keep exercising when there's no one beside you? So we certainly saw the, uh, the pop-up home gyms for a while, and we certainly saw an awful lot of uh, internet information circulating. We tried to look after each other. This was one of the biggest impacts to our seniors, and I'm sure the rural community as well. Digital exclusion. How did you know what was going on unless you were watching online? I know the 1pm briefings became like a television series for many of us. We couldn't wait to see what was coming up next. We had no idea what the government was doing, but we loved screening in at 1pm every day to find out. So we know that digital exclusion occurs for many reasons. It's costly, it's complicated, it's new, it's scary, it's just hard sometimes. Maybe you don't have connectivity, maybe you're one of the rural people that are waiting for your connectivity to arrive. Maybe your device is old and it doesn't support the new programs. Maybe you were given a device by your family, all good hearted, but actually it's, you're locked out and you don't know how to get in. Maybe your bank closed and the information that you were going to get had to be online. We saw so many activities here where digital exclusion meant that you weren't kept up to date. Actually, at Age Concern, we established an 0800 number because at the end of the day, I know that everyone loves getting on the phone. So 0800 65 to 105 became our catch cry. I know if you haven't heard about it, you have heard about it now. So our responses from the community. People, oh my goodness, people were fantastic. They looked after neighbours, they dropped off milk, they picked up medications. We were dependent on our, our neighbourhood to look after ourselves. And those people responded where needed. But they weren't alone. Organisations did as well. We were inundated with people who wanted to volunteer, who wanted to help in some way. New Zealanders are good at helping. We like to get in and do something. It's hard when you're not allowed to disrupt bubbles or go and visit people. So organisations became quite phone-like, and they started joining in the phone calls. So we actually had a number of us ringing, a number of us to, to check in on us. I think this is really good. I'd love to see us continue that. Let's check in. Check in on a mate, check on each other, check on that family member. So organisations responded really well. And then communities, the, the likes of civil defence, the likes of local district health boards, the likes of local organisations like ourselves. Ourselves and the likes of RSA and veterans re rallied together to say actually what could we do better. We know that um, older people needed to eat, older people needed to get nutrition, they needed to get medicines. Who could do that? There was always some hand up, someone providing something. So our communities responded. Let's not stop responding and let's make sure that we include everybody. So local solutions for us, the paying of shopping. We were so used to going to that supermarket, aren't we? Well, what, what, so you couldn't go to the supermarket. What, so you need an internet to get to the supermarket, to get your groceries, to get your toilet paper, you know, to, to get your, your, your hand creams, everything. So actually we found that we had to help seniors with that digital exclusion. How can we help? How can we do it for you? I know our local age concerns rung local supermarkets, and some supermarkets had a priority line for 65-year-olds, but that was inundated. Because as you know, and I know, that our ageing population is increasing and there are more older people out there. 
we need more solutions. Bill payments was another one. And, and today would be the same with bank closures, with the change of how we do our financial management, with less cash circulating. How do you pay for those bills on time so your electricity is not cut off, so you're not disconnected from the world? So we, again, the digital exclusion meant that we put our hand up and we helped our seniors. Mail also closed. That was really interesting. The mail didn't come. So actually, we needed to think about that. How do we get our, our resources? Who was giving things out? How, how are they coming to us? It, it became more complicated, but it, we needed to understand it. And the other thing that we do is we vet all our volunteers. How do we do that differently? We were getting inundated with volunteers that wanted to help. Let's do that together. We actually saw, and this is around the physicality, we saw an increase in falls because people weren't doing the normal activities. They weren't getting out. I know if you, if you were like me, when I started going for a walk in the middle of the day, there were everyone walking the streets. We were, we were loving the no cars on the streets. We enter, were entertained and giving that nod as we went past people. We were staying connected. So exercise is so important. But we did see an increase in falls. So we needed to think, actually, how can we get more information around exercise? Flyer drops, telling people to do those seven exercises that help you stay upright and mobile. Information around what you could do for yourself. So a need, and we needed to collaborate better. So we, we saw we did it really well, but we want to keep doing it really well. Collaboration across the age concerns, across the charity sector, across the not-for-profits, across, across all the communities that look after each other. How can we continue to do that, that we have already started? And again, as I mentioned, older people's mental health really did uh, plummet in some areas. And look, that's understandable. It's OK to ask for help. It's actually OK to pick up the phone and say, I'm not having a good day. I don't know why I'm not having a good day, but I don't really feel that bright today. Because you, you know that someone needs you. Just pick up the phone. And people love helping. And older people were restricted or reluctant to go to the supermarket. And we're still seeing a little bit of that today. And particularly with the new variant that has arrived, there is a fear. What happens if I get that? What happens if I get sick? Not just if my health service will be able to cope, but will my family come to visit me? Will, will they be allowed to? Will they be, will they be within reach? Families are really important. So I just thought I'd tell you a few case studies. And I, the, the case studies are something that brings all the work that we do to life. And that's where we have an older person or an, or an agency like Age Concern or a community that come together to make a difference. So my organisation story is about um, one of our local Age Concerns who actually got donated cards in lockdown. Lots of cards, lots and lots of cards. So all their volunteers spent time just writing. How are you? What have you been doing? You know, I, I, I've, I've missed going overseas. What's going on in your world? Um, I hope you're well. And these are a few things to do to look after yourself. Getting a card in today's world makes a huge difference. That written word, that moment you've taken to do it, made a huge difference to an older person. And we got lots of comments back. Can we do that again? We want to be involved. We want to see a, re a, a resurgence of the mail again. We just love seeing that coming through the letterbox. Another one about organisations is where we actually opened up one of our offices and civil defence, the local council and the local district board came together to put food available to everybody. So as a community, they started putting food together and then identifying, and all of them identified people that needed that food. It could be given in units or, or bags, or it could be um, people were on the phone asking what people wanted. You don't want to get what you want, don't want to eat. And the last individual one, I think, um, hit home to me. And I mentioned about the isolation and loneliness. And this was a result of someone having a, a happenstance call. Someone picked up the phone to call this person, one of our members, and the members member was really down, just sort of, just really flat, you know, just not happy. Well, not ha just happy, but just didn't seem quite right. So that caller said at the end of the call, you know, I've got time next week. Can I call again? That older person said, yeah, I suppose if you, if you really want to. 
you know, if you really want to and go out of your way to do it, you know, the caller said, yeah, I do, you know, it's important to me. But that caller called the following week and the gentleman was still a little bit flat. At the end of the call, the caller said again, yeah, mate, I can do it again. Do you mind me calling back? He said, what are you talking about? I mean, we're not really talking about anything. The caller said, that's fine. I just really enjoy, you know, having a chat. Anyway, long story short, over a period of time, uh, we found that um, they have connected, they've been socially ex act active again and the communities started getting together. And that person has social confidence to get out and about. But if you do need any help, we've established with an, a group of great organisations like ourselves, a campaign to end loneliness. I know there's a stigma out there. I know people are embarrassed. Being lonely, being chronically lonely, is not, it's not about having no friends, it's about having no way forward. So let's talk about it. Loneliness is really important that we can all solve together. We certainly have a responsibility to our community to look after it. I have a responsibility to my neighbourhood to make sure I notice them. I have a responsibility to my family. I have lots of responsibilities that I know everyone has in their world. Just reach forward, it is solvable. If you want to join us on this campaign to end loneliness, we want to light up loneliness, we want to talk about it. We don't want any stigmas. We want actually people to say, I need help, or can I have another conversation, or can you give me a call? So give us a call. So age concern, I wondered if you, you probably know a little bit about us, but I just thought I'd say that we're 75 years old. We are past our retirement age, but we are not retiring. We were established by an organisation in Otago 75 years later. Today, I have 34 local age concerns across New Zealand with front doors that anyone can open. This organisation was based on giving community support, giving meals, creating connections, 34 years later, we're doing the same, but with digital technology. So we've come a long way, but we haven't come far. So where are we? Have a check of the map. I'm sure you'll find somewhere close. If you don't know where we are, just give us a call. 0865 to 105, it's a great number. 65 to 105, that's four decades. I'm sure that we can all receive help, give help, and be involved. And so, from everybody at Age Concern, everybody across the country, I hope that we are working together to make a difference. If you've got any questions, give us a call, pop us a line, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much for your time today, and I look forward to talking more. Thank you, Stephanie. If you'd like to ask Stephanie a question about Age Concern New Zealand, please go to the presenter's breakout room. And she'll be there to ask answer all your questions you may have about age concern in New Zealand and where they are around New Zealand. Just to remind our audience as well, we have the Veterans Affairs Information Breakout Room as well. If you want to talk to any of our staff about what Veterans Affairs can uh, support they can give to you or advice, please have a look at that in the breakout room. Next, we're going to play a couple of short videos. Just to give you some information about some of the support you can receive from Veteran Affairs. After you've contacted Veteran Affairs and your medical condition has been accepted as service related, you would usually be assigned a case manager. In some cases, depending on the type of support you require and the complexity of your needs, a case manager is assigned immediately. They'll provide you with advice on what support and services you may be able to get or your application is being processed. Depending on your circumstances, they will also discuss with you any treatment or rehabilitation you may need. If for any reason you can't talk to us yourself, you can appoint a representative to act on your behalf or appoint an enduring power of attorney. We all run into money issues sometimes, and if you owe us money, unfortunately, we expect you to pay it back. This may take time, and if you're not coping, talk to us and we'll work with you to come up with a repayment plan and encourage you to seek budget advice for your future. Everyone's situation is different and tends to change often. When your situation changes, for example your health, relationship, contact details, even if you're going overseas, we need to know so we can adjust your support to better suit your needs. After all, 
We're here to help you get the best support you can. If you live outside of New Zealand, you can still get support if you meet the normal eligibility criteria. However, because you live overseas, there may be some differences to how you receive support. So it is important to talk with us as early as possible. Support may include one-off and regular support payments and a range of other support services to help you find or stay in work or to help you remain living independently at home for as long as possible. Depending on where you live, your support may be delivered by another organisation and payments may be treated as income and taxed as such. If you're planning to move overseas, let us know as early as possible so we can guide you through how to maintain the best level of support. And if you're already overseas, check your eligibility for support on our website and get in touch with us to register. We'll take it from there. Also, let us know if you're coming back to New Zealand. If it was just for a visit, we can help you access any support needed while you're here. If it was to retire, we can help you understand what you might need to do to test your eligibility for government support. The Code of Veterans and Other Covers Rights is your code and entitles you to the best and fairest service possible. By the code, we promise to treat you with dignity and respect. Take into account that you may be under physical, emotional, social, or financial strain. We'll treat you fairly and equally in all dealings with us, regardless of rank or operational experience, and to listen to and consider your views. We'll respect your culture, values, and beliefs. We welcome the presence of a nominated support person or persons to help you through our journey together. We'll communicate with you openly, honestly, and in a timely manner, and support you by providing information and a form you can access, including interpretation services if required. We'll provide you with full and correct information about your claim, entitlements, support services, obligations, and responsibilities and about how best to access our services. And finally, we'll respect your privacy. And if you think our service falls short of the standards outlined in the code, you can ask for a review or lodge a complaint to resolve the issue. It's only fair that you serve your country, you get served fairly. At Veterans Affairs, we make decisions about your support based on the information you give us about your condition and your service. It's great if you give us as much information as possible so we can make a decision including what you did during your service. Sometimes we may need to check the information you provide with health professionals or other agencies. There are a number of ways we can connect an injury or illness to your qualifying service. For example, we can use the statements of principles to establish a causal link between your claim condition and your qualifying service. In other words, the statements of principles help us to figure out if certain conditions can be linked to specific circumstances of qualifying service. One of the other ways is if your injury occurred during a qualifying operation or if a condition was aggravated by serving in a qualifying operation. If you believe your service has caused or contributed to an injury or illness, contact us or visit our website to test your eligibility for support. You can use the tool on our website to check if your service is covered. If you disagree with a decision we have made, then you have a couple of options available to remedy the situation. Firstly, you can talk to us, and if there's been a mistake, we can possibly put things right without having to go through a formal review. Or, if the reason for the decision is not clear, and you'd like it explained, just let us know. If there is new information that may support your claim, we'd like to hear about that, and we'll see if it could change the claim decision. You can ask for a formal review within six months of being notified of a decision. 
A review officer will look into your case and determine if the decision is correct. You can find the application forms for that on our website. It is helpful if you tell us why you don't agree and to send us any extra information that you'd like us to consider. You can request an appeal if you disagree with the outcome of your review. Your case will be considered by the Independent Veterans Entitlement Appeal Board at a hearing which you can attend by video or teleconference or in person if you're in New Zealand. Again, you'll find the link for that on our website. And if you still disagree with the outcome, you can appeal to the High Court of New Zealand. You can ask for a decision to be reconsidered if things have changed since we made our original decision. For example, an application may have been denied because a deployment wasn't considered to be qualify an operational service at the time of the claim. However, if that deployment does qualify later, you can ask us to reconsider our decision. You can also apply for reconsideration at any time if you have any new information that has not been considered before. We may then reconsider your claim. Contact us if you'd like to talk about it. Welcome back, guys. Just like to welcome back Sharon Kavanagh, the Manager of Veteran Services. Talk a bit more detail about the ingratiate payments for our Vietnam veterans and their families. Sharon. Thanks, Brett. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Sharon Kavanagh, tōku inoa. Look, following on from my earlier presentation this morning, I wanted to let you know that we have updated some of our frequently asked questions on the website this morning, and that's been generated from some questions from surviving spouses. So I thought if I just expanded on the presentation and answered those two questions that we've added. So here goes. I am the surviving spouse of a Vietnam veteran. Can I apply for this ex gratia payment? So the response to that is, if you are the surviving spouse or partner of someone who had qualifying operational service in Vietnam, you may qualify for an ex gratia payment of $25,000. Now that's if um, your spouse or partner has died from one of the seven prescribed conditions, which includes the two new conditions that were signed off uh, by the government last week of hypertension and MGAS, as I mentioned this morning, monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. So, as well as that, also if your partner did not receive an ex gratia payment for any of those conditions earlier. If your partner <coughs> died from MGAS or hypertension, between the 1st of November 2018 and the 29th of November, so that's Monday of last week when the government approved the funding for the two new conditions, then your ex gratia payment would be $40,000. And the idea behind that is so that you are not disadvantaged. Had, that pa had there been entitlement at the time that your partner died, so there is no eligibility for an ex gratia for MGUS or hypertension before the 1st of November 2018. And that's because under the terms of the current mem uh, Memorandum of Understanding, the ex gratia dates uh, <coughs> approved by the National Institute of Medicine in the US, they published those from the 1st of November 2018. I hope that makes sense, but if not, please don't hesitate to phone our 0800 number. That's our free phone number, 0800 483 8372. And I have one more question to clarify for you. So how do I make a claim if my spouse or partner died of one of these conditions between November 2018 and now. What you do is send us your information, your name, uh, postal address and email address plus phone number, your partner's full name and date of birth, a copy of the full birth certificate, uh, sorry, death certificate showing the cause of death, consent for veterans affairs, 
to obtain the veteran's medical records, marriage certificate or proof of relationship at the time of your partner's death, and bank account payment, uh, details to enable us to make the payment. I urge any of you, however, if you're unsure, don't hesitate to submit an application because that way you will receive formal notification of that decision. Kia ora, nahi, na mihi. Thank you, Sharon. Oh, yeah, can I say Thank you, Sharon. Um, great information for our Vietnam veterans community and thanks very much. Please don't be shy to give us a ring at Veteran Affairs or put in the comments on the Zoom or the Facebook chat. It's my pleasure now to welcome our next guest, our Minister for Veterans, the Honourable Mecca Faitiri. Good afternoon, Minister. Oh, kia ora, everybody. And a special hello to you all, the veterans watching out there today. It's a real pleasure for me to join you and your families today in what I know is a first for Veterans Affairs. It's great to see so many organisations on hand as well to support the event today. I know that the services and supports that uh, they provide to you and your whānau are greatly appreciated. Last week, I announced that two new conditions associated with Agent Orange exposure had been added to the list of prescribed conditions for our Vietnam veterans. Cabinet has confirmed that funding will be available to pay out the ex gratia payments to over 700 of our Vietnam veterans. This shows the government's commitment to our veterans, and I know that my officials in VA are committed to working as quickly as possible to have all ex gratia payments made to eligible Vietnam veterans by the end of February 2022. Like me, you and your whānau have welcomed the warmth of summer after what's been a long and tough year for our veteran community. Over the past months, I've seen how Kiwi veterans are coping and helping each other cope with lockdowns and restrictions. Sticking by your mates, doing things for your mates, that's what our people do so well. I know you will continue to do this under the new traffic light system. So to all of those who have helped out by delivering food parcels, making phone calls, visiting where it's possible, and getting vaccinated and encouraging others to do so well as well, a big mihi aroha to you all. For me, the restrictions we've had to live with have made the chances I've had to meet up with veterans and to talk to them especially precious. A highlight for me this year was spending time with more than 220 J-Force veterans and their families in Wellington when the 75th anniversary of J-Force was marked in March. It was an honour to have a meal and a chat with those who were able to come along. And at the, end, at the end of the year, in late October, I attended another very moving event in Christchurch. This was the rededication of the grave of the First World War veteran, Henry Nicholas, Nicholas VCMM. Thanks to a lot of work started by an individual veteran and completed by the RSA and the Remembrance Army. The grave which was damaged in the Christchurch earthquake has now been restored and is a fitting memorial to a hero heroic fighter. This project was a wonderful example of veterans helping veterans and helping to make sure that service is recognised and celebrated. I want to acknowledge also those who have served in Afghanistan. The events that unfolded back in August were no doubt met with mixed emotions and you may have questioned the meaning of your service. We are all proud of the service you gave and the difference you made to the lives of an entire generation of people. And that's also my mission as your minister. Those who are prepared to put themselves on the line 
for country and Fano deserve our recognition and our thanks. And in the coming year, I'll be doing whatever I can to make sure that this happens. Thank you, team, for making this happen. I'm sure that everyone is finding today's court at all with veterans very interesting. Finally, I wish all of you and those you love a happy and safe Krihi Miti and New Year. Tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you, Minister. If you'd like to talk to the Minister, she is kindly giving up her time to be in our presenter's breakout room for anyone to ask her a question on support for veterans and their whānau. Our next presenter of the day is Kelly Blythe. Now, Kelly is the Chief Executive of the Ranfurly Veterans Trust. Hi there, Kelly. Kia ora. Welcome. It's great to have you here. My name is Kelly Blythe. I am the CEO of Ranfurly Veterans Trust. Today we're going to talk a little bit about who Ranfurly is, our history and who we help. The Ranfurly Veterans Trust is a charitable organisation made up of a small team working collaboratively with other veteran organisations to care for and support veterans in New Zealand. Ranfilly was established in 1903 by the 13th Governor-General, Lord Ranfilly, who had the vision to care for veterans, creating a living memorial in recognition of those who paid the ultimate sacrifice and for those returning from war. The home opened in 1903 on the 10th of December with 40 veterans in residence, 118 years ago. As you can imagine, over this period of time, there have been substantial changes, but one thing remains the same. The Ranfilly Veterans Trust continues to care for those who have served. The home was administered by a board of trustees until 1915, when ownership was passed to the Auckland Provincial Patriotic War Relief Association. In the 1950s, the home was acquired by the New Zealand Patriotic and Canteen Funds Board, along with Monte Cecilio in Dunedin, Levin Home for War Veterans and Ranadale in Christchurch. In 1954, the name was changed to Ranfilly Veterans Home and Hospital to commemorate Lord Ranfilly's pivotal role and his foresight. Considerable expansion of capacity and services took place at Ranfilly over the next 30 years. And at peak, the facilities comprised of an 83 bed rest home and a 35 bed hospital and a 24 bed dementia unit and employed over 100 full and part time staff. In 2002, ownership came full circle and was returned to the locally based Ranfilly Trust. The focus of the trust was continued operation of Ranfilly Hospital. However, it was clear the facilities largely built in the 1950s and 60s were out of date and required major refurbishment or replacement. The trustees gave considerable thought to these matters and the future use of the land. In 2004, discussions began with the board on how best to develop the site to ensure that veterans would continue to be cared for in the future. A partnership between Generous Living and the Ranfilly Veterans Trust was formed. The trustees finalised the agreement for a joint venture to redevelop the site. In 2011, redevelopment of Ranfilly Hospital and Veterans Home commenced. The plans called for the provision of a new purpose-built 60-bed hospital and veteran home, the refurbishment of Ranfilly House and Veteran Centre, the original home, and the development of a retirement village consisting of 192 apartments. It's rather exciting to see that the development is now in the final stages with the last apartment block due for completion in 2022. The Ranfilly Veterans Trust works closely with veteran organisations such as SANES, the RSA, Veterans Affairs and the Poppy Foundation 
among others. We can provide support to veterans through our partner organisations or directly to veterans living in New Zealand who have served in, New in the New Zealand Defence Force or allied countries and received the New Zealand Service Medal or equivalent. Our key areas of focus are care and support, commemoration, continuous improvement and communication and collaboration. So let me touch on these quickly. The Ranfilly Veterans Trust provides priority access to care and support for veterans and their whanau at the Ranfilly Hospital. Each year, the Trust provides over $100,000 in donations to the Hospital for Specialist Care of Veterans. More recently, the Ranfilly Veterans Trust, together with the hospital, have established the first veteran respite bed. This means respite care is available to veterans and veteran whanau when they need it. And it enables carers to take a much needed and well-deserved break, reducing the likelihood of carer stress and burnout, whilst ensuring the veteran and veteran whanau member receives appropriate and adequate care. In 2018, the Trust established the Poppy Foundation Trust to ensure veterans in need received equal access to welfare. The Trust provided over $400,000 in seed funding, and there are now 11 RSAs in, the, in Auckland who belong to the Poppy Foundation Trust. Over the past three years, the Trust has paid out over $295,000 and approved 1,472 claims in Auckland. Ranfilly Veterans Trust hosts an annual ANZAC commemoration for our veterans and their whanau. Normally we would have 300 close friends and family or more at Ranfilly attending. Over the past few years, we've had to do things a little differently due to COVID-19. So we've had a veteran lunch with smaller ANZAC services. Attending these services has been one of the big highlights of my role. As part of our plan for continuous improvement, the Trust has set up the Ranfilly Veterans Centre. Currently, we host some veteran organisations such as the RSA District Support Manager for Auckland, Veterans Affairs, Hearing and Podiatry Clinics. The aim is to have a central place where veterans can go to receive all services and support for health and wellbeing. Connection, communication and collaboration, we believe is the key to success. Working with like-minded organisations to provide care and support and information to veterans and their families. We've partnered with the RSA to establish the first district support manager role in Auckland and we've worked with Veterans Affairs to deliver the expos and forums around New Zealand to ensure veterans and their whanau have the most relevant and up-to-date information. And I look forward to seeing you all in Christchurch for the next forum next year. Ranfilly Veterans Trust worked with 29 other organisations in 2018 to launch We Served. We Served is a centralised online service directory for veterans and whanau where they can find information about veteran organisations and areas of support such as employment, health and wellbeing, housing, financial and family support. We've recently set up an advisory committee represented by current and ex-serving members to shape the future of We Serve New Zealand and ensure it remains relevant and continues to support veterans and their families in the future. We're here to help, so if you'd like more information, please visit our website or contact us on 09 625 8310. Thank you very much for tuning in today and thank you for your service. I'm happy to answer any questions now.
Thank you, Kelly. If you'd like to ask Kelly a question about the Ram Fairley Veterans Trust and how they may be able to support you, please go to the presenter breakout room and she'll meet you there. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the VA team today, thank you. It's been my pleasure to guide you throughout today. We hope that you have found this kōrero useful and rewarding. For those who are still serving, to get eligibility, those looking at transitioning out of the Defence Force, give us a ring. Those who have left Defence Force, give us a ring. You know our 0800 number. We're there Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. I would now like to pass you back to the Head of Veteran Affairs, Bernadine McKenzie and Victor Temu to complete our corridor. Bernadine. Thank you very much, Brett. It's been great having you as our MC today. Um, as we go forward and think about ourselves over the next few weeks and our build up to Christmas, um, I want all of you to think and to look after yourselves. It's really critical at this time that we do show our care and attention for everyone. So thanks everyone for joining us online today. Thank you to our Minister for Veterans for being able to join us earlier and to the organisations that were here today sharing great presentations and answering your questions. As you head to the Christmas holidays, as I said, please take the time to look after yourself. Please stay safe and take care. My staff and I really look forward to serving you again in 2022. We wish you and your loved ones a safe and happy Christmas season. I'd now like to invite Vic back to deliver our closing karakia. Thank you, Vic, and thank you, everybody. Ka kite anō. Kia ora te kai whakahaere, a tēnei te mihi atu ki a koe anō. Ka karakia, a whakakapi anai anai, a me inoi tātou. E te atua, o mai ki a mātou. Tōu maramatanga, tōu rangi marie, tōu kaha me tōu aroha mō tēnei rā. O Lord, give us this, your challenge, your calmness, your strength and love on this day. Amen. And may I thank everyone for their attendance. Thank you very much. Kia ora.